Good morning uh, uh, and welcome to this Paris Arbitration Week session brought to you by Field Fisher and BlackRock um, Expert Services. My name is Simon Sloan. I'll, I'll be your moderator today. Just a few housekeeping points before we start. Uh, the seminar will be one hour long, not two as advertised in the PAW schedule. So you'll be relieved to hear that. Uh, each speaker will present for about 10 minutes, and then we'll hopefully have 10 to 15 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. If you look on your function uh, buttons on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see there is a, a question function. Please send me questions, and I will allocate them to the speakers. Uh, we'll take questions right at the end. Um, so today's um, session, Construction Disputes, and avoiding this, uh, delays in uh, conflict resolution is a familiar issue. Um, we're all familiar with the, the, the primary issues, namely failure to comply with contractual obligations, including particularly the failure to properly administer the contract and the obligations under the contract, errors in omissions in, in contract documentation and design frequently arise, and then the suspension and termination provisions of the contract, which is particularly relevant during uh, the, the, the current COVID uh, times. And then finally, underpricing at the tender stage, which can lead to solvency and potential uh, insolvency of contractors. We are fortunate to have four experts in their field today uh, presenting on this topic. Marilee Paralika. Marilee is a partner in our Paris office and heads our French international arbitration offering. She's also uh, a member of the ICC court uh, as a member for Greece. Uh, we have Luke Corvesis, a mechanical engineer with specific expertise in the energy sector. Uh, Luke is a delay expert and a director in BlackRock's Paris office. Ewan McLean is a chartered civil engineer uh, and a partner at BlackRock. He's an expert. Um, in delay analysis. And finally, but not least, we have Colin Gibson, uh, our global head of dispute resolution, Phil Fisher, based in London office. Colin, uh, could you lead us off, please, uh, discussing how best to avoid disputes? Thank you very much, Simon. I hope everyone can hear me properly, and I apologize in advance. I'm going to speak in English, parce que je parle français comme une vache espagnol, uh, but this is Paris Arbitration Week. Uh, and welcome to this seminar. My name is Colin Gibson. I'm the head of the disputes team at Field Fisher. I've led on various construction arbitrations, including in relation to state, football stadium construction, electricity stinging, stringing, uh, power plants, gas storage. For domestic uh, English adjudications and litigation, Field Fisher has a much better team than me, uh, and we have a wonderful construction advisory team. I hope that these slides and this short talk will give you some idea of uh, what we do and some idea how to avoid delay when disputes do arise in international uh, construction projects. So uh, starting, the slides are gonna be slow, so if I seem confused on my slides, please forgive me. Uh, starting out, avoiding delays in con conflict resolution. The format of the, re the seminar is uh, very much that I will look first at how projects can, from a legal perspective, be set up and managed in order to ensure that delay is minimized as much as possible when claims do arise and when they turn into disputes. Our colleagues from BlackRock will then look specifically at managing and calculating delay and disruption in a project context. Finally, Marily Paralika will bring us back to legal process and look at avoiding delay once an arbitration becomes necessary. We will all focus on the practical and strategic delay avoidance rather than getting into the weeds of law and analysis. Uh, 10 minutes is a very short time, so I better get on. Um, and I do tend to stop, make jokes and tell stories, but I've only got a short time. Uh, right at the beginning, it's essential to start thinking about the legals throughout the project and any claims proactive management and knowing the contract will always put you in a better position. So let's start with the contract. 
In international construction projects, FIDIC Rainbow Suite is the most commonly used form. Uh, the 1999 suite was relatively recently replaced with the 2017 update. I'm a massive FIDIC fan. I will mention FIDIC in this webinar, and I like that there is plenty of learning in the FIDIC universe to help practitioners when a dispute does arise. In particular jurisdictions, you may of course find certain forms popular for domestic or public projects. For example, in uh, London where I'm sitting now, JCT and NEC are very popular. You will come across bespoke or employer's own contracts and they can work, but I've seen some lazy and in fact some awful ones when I've been doing my disputes and I do prefer established forms where there is some certainty and visibility on what will happen if something goes wrong. My advice is do not save money at the outset by avoiding getting clear advice at the contracting stage. Poor wording can be a major cause of disputes and delay. A good example is the gap that was said to exist in FIDIC 1987 and 1999 on which Neil Bunny and Christopher Sapala wrote in a very learned fashion. Uh, it created uncertainty as, where, as to when an arbitration could commence following a DAB. I think that's been cured. It was cured prior to 2017 and in 2017, but it's a good example of where things can go wrong. Although this is not a FIDIC advertisement, I will say that FIDIC has set out a complete code for getting from claims to disputes to arbitration if necessary. I like it. There's established practice. The 2017 suite made a standing dispute adjudication and avoidance board mainstream, taking its lead from the 1999 Red Book. There are lots of steps and guidelines, and it can be lengthy, but it avoids claims accumulation and it leads to use it or lose it. I think that's healthy. Delays should be avoided, claims should not build up. I'm just trying to change slide. But FIDIC does, with its now three stage process, uh, lead sometimes to delay if it's manipulated. It is orderly and makes some sense, but I would say to you from a practical perspective, do consider whether FIDIC suits you if you don't want to go through all of those steps to get to where you need to be. Uh, if you're using a bespoke, ah, my slide has changed, thank you. If you're using a bespoke contract, do look out for first applicable law. This can be important for a variety of issues, e.g. damages, rules, interest, etc. But the context in the context of delay, it can affect when a dispute is said to have crystallized. I've seen blind agreement to applicable law, and in one case, the application of two conflicting laws of neighboring states. That was an electricity stringing contract. Think about what you need and how it will slow you down if you get into a dispute. Notice of claims clauses are important. It is critical to understand when a notice must be given, how and in what detail. Clarity avoids delay. Cases throughout uh, the world have reviewed, uh, when the courts have reviewed um, arbitrations, have reviewed when notices are conditions precedent uh, and what can happen afterwards. Some of them get gummed up for years. Escalation and ADR are important. It may be desirable to have an engineer's decision, escalation to senior management, mediation, etc. But each step takes time and is an opportunity for delay. If NODs are built in as well, that's another hazard. And again, if a notice is a condition precedent and is missed or unclear, then that will create satellite disputes. Adjudication uh, is another clause to look at carefully. A standing board, as adopted in FIDIC now, can iron out delay. I've had two arbitrations where the chief cause of delay and satellite disputes was the formation of a DAB. Uh, I think if I look at the number of articles that have been written about delay and game playing around the formula, formation of a DAB, a standing board is good, it's more expensive, and that's to be borne in mind. 
but if you have a standing board, you have the twin benefits that you can get some advice from the standing board and also it's there and ready if it's required. Uh, on my next slide, I'll come on to arbitration clauses. And I do want to mention briefly force majeure. Uh, FM clauses have always been important. In a COVID-19 lockdown, as Simon says, we've seen how important they can be. It's worth looking at a clause to see what protection it gives. And if it's vague, then looking at the applicable law. My own view is that a more detailed clause and more prescriptive is better than a vague clause leaving the uh, the definition of act of God or whatever term you've used to the applicable law. So arbitration clauses, uh, my favorite bit, such a cause of delay, argument, satellite litigation and game playing. Um, sometimes that's by me, but not in this case, I'm the good guys. First, make sure it's clear when you can arbitrate. It is critical to understand that. Don't have too many hurdles. If there are escalation steps as conditions precedent, do make them clear and not subject to acts of third parties or liable to argument by act of third party, for example, an appointing board for DAB. I saw one agreement that had an adjudication as a condition precedent, but with an appointing body that didn't exist. That is a recipe for delay. If you choose an institution for your arbitration, why? What is it giving you? The mainstream institutions, ICC, LCIA, SEAC, SCC, will proactively manage a dispute and get the tribunal appointed. They do add value and help to avoid delay. But there are major differences. I won't run through all of them here, but they can affect the speed at which you move and should be considered at the drafting stage. For example, ICC now has an expedited procedure for claim values of less than $2 million and also an emergency arbitrator provision. SCC permits a very fast emergency arbitrator before full tribunal formation and again, an expedited procedure. Interestingly, ICC expedited procedure is opt out, i.e. it applies unless you specifically say in your contract it won't. Whereas SCC is opt in so that you have to spec specify that you wish this to be available. This is a good example of where your choice on rules and your choice of clause right at the beginning can dictate how fast you can move if you get into a dispute. LCIA permits expedited formation of the tribunal itself, as well as the appointment of an emergency arbitrator. The seat may be important also, as local law can affect formation, especially if the clause is poor and some jurisdictions don't enforce interim measures. Marily tells me Italy is one, and do ask a question to Marily later if you're Italian and you say that that's wrong. It would be fun to watch. Uh, proactive claims management is a topic uh, that is close to my heart. Managing claims properly is so easy to do if you're organized, but it is frequently missed by the people responsible for doing so. I've done projects where the contract was never agreed, let alone signed. When it is signed, I've seen cases where rights were lost because notices were not given. Often that's because those administering the contract did not realize there was a contractual formality or time limit. Don't put the contract in a drawer. Know your rights and obligations. Notices are conditions precedent. No notice can mean no claim. Poor notice can mean satellite litigation and delay. Proactive management of claims is rewarded. Take advice if needed. Speak to BlackRock, that's the advertisement for them, if needed at this stage. Do try using the DAAB or amicable solution, but don't miss the formalities while you try. Finally, a quick mention in a recap slide. Your own team may not be best placed to tell you when you should elevate your claims. Sometimes your own team will have done bad drafting. Sometimes they will be responsible for bad management. This is not meant to sound insulting, but I have seen it. Do take external legal advice. That's not me selling my wares, but it's worthwhile. 
Also, if you use ADR at any point, do consider the full range of options, mediation, MEDARB, escalation, or DAAB guidance. Disputes are usually, in my view, despite it being my profession, best avoided. And finally, I think if this comes up, a good reason to get it right in making your contract and giving notices. If you do well and have good drafting and documentation, then arbitration is more avoidable. This slide shows what we all know. Cost, lack of effective sanctions, lack of speed are among the worst characteristics of arbitration. Having said that, I absolutely love it. Now, over to Simon to introduce BlackRock. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, a very uh, helpful uh, summary in the limited time available. Uh, Luke is now going to address um, some of the expert issues, in particular, his perception of why contract uh, projects fail. Luke, uh, please lead us off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yes, uh, I would start by saying that in order to avoid delays, first you need to identify them and measure them. Therefore, I will be speaking about the importance of the baseline program and the program updates in general. First off, okay, okay, here we are. First off, why projects fail? Um, I think that first and foremost, we should uh, discuss openly that projects fail because contractors trying to get uh, as many contracts as possible in an economic environment that is difficult. They are being really aggressive when they are bidding for projects. Therefore, um, they are underpricing their jobs and also they are imposing themselves onto um, impossible time schedules. So the projects, even from day one, they're set to fail because I understand that an owner might like to have a new bridge in three months or a new airport in four months. However, this is not possible, even if the contract says so. Then we have uh, poor contract drafting and contract management. Uh, as uh, Simon also explained, you might have a contract that is maybe too rigid, so people can, uh, are trying to find ways to work around that, or maybe too loose, where people are actually spending lots and lots of time arguing whether they should uh, follow one paragraph or the other. And then we have seen cases where uh, the contractors do not actually use a contract manager. Therefore, practically, no one is really following the contract to the letter. Then we have unforeseen events and changes. We now live in the COVID-19 era, where uh, this uh, needs to be addressed, both in contracts and in the real life of the construction project. And also we have changes, changes of scope, changes of design that actually create friction between the parties and in most cases, delays as well. We have the visibility and monitoring of the design. The design is always a moot point because different parties have different understandings on whether the design is finalized or not and scrutinized or not. Therefore, the visibility everyone has on the design itself and the monitoring of the progress of the design is also a really key factor that actually causes projects to fail. Last but not least, we have the poor monitoring and the poor record keeping that actually lead to the poor reporting and the poorly defined critical path. Uh, being an engineer myself, I understand that in the construction side, it might be actually too boring to be keeping notes about everything, to keep records about all the small uh, and jobs and tasks and sub projects that you have running in parallel. However, if you just don't keep proper records and these records find their way into a poor report and then you define your critical path poorly, you are setting your project to fail because practically, no one knows whether the project is in delay or not, and no one knows whether the project is actually progressing as it should have or not. Um, now I will be talking about the importance of the baseline. Um, uh, that is often uh, neglected. Uh, the baseline is the first program of the project, is also a con the first contractual requirement. Um, the wrong definition of the scope within the baseline, the baseline can, lead to, uh, can lead to delays. The wrong logic can also lead to the wrong definition of the critical path and wrong focus of works. If we are missing any contractual milestones, this also may lead to critical delays and delayed damages. And also, you should not forget, and especially in cases where we have dispute resolution, um, that the baseline is measured to measure delays against. And now I will walk you through an example of a correct baseline against the wrong baseline. Let's take a simple construction project. We need to build uh, a building with three floors 
and uh, the total construction time is 15 months. Also, we need to deliver the second floor after nine months. So a correct and really high level baseline would look like this. We would have the foundation works, then the first floor, then the second floor, followed by the delivery of the second floor, then the third floor, test and commissioning and taking over date. However, uh, I also acknowledge that during the first stages of the project, the parties are really rushing into building the project. And since they, they want to um, draft and commonly accept the baseline, they might accept a baseline that might be wrong. This, uh, this simple example comes from a real case where we had a baseline where the foundation works would be followed by the second floor, then it would be followed by the first floor, and then we would have the third floor. You don't have to, to be a top engineer to understand that you're not supposed to be building the second floor before the first floor. And also, we have this testing commissioning, commissioning not properly linked with the, with the overall program, and there was no taking over date. And that program was accepted. So let's now, now look at what happens if you have a wrong baseline accepted and you're trying to measure delays against the said program. Let's move forward on 1st of May 2021, where the first floor was completed. I have two questions for you. One, was the project in delay at that point? And if so, by how much? Normally, we measure delays against, um, against the baseline, and we are using what we call as-built dates, dates of uh, real events, practically. So if you compare the finished date of the first floor against the planned date of the first floor, you will see that there is one month of difference. So someone would argue that, okay, the project is in one month of delay. However, if you also measure the delivery of the second floor in the wrong baseline against the, the same activity in the program update, you will see that there are seven months of delay. So someone else would argue in a claim that there are seven months of delay in this job. But then we also have another layer of complexity where if you measure the taking over date in the rock baseline that has not actually been put in against the forecast taking over date of the job at that point, you might measure five months of delay. So here's the question. Is the project in one month of delay, five months or seven months? Actually, the correct answer is none of the above because if the, the planner, the contractor had properly uh, drafted uh, their uh, baseline, we would see that the first floor was planned to be actually built within October and December 2020. And if we measure against that date, the actual build date that we have, the correct number is four months of delay. Therefore, the project on that stage was in four months of delay, but the wrong baseline did not really help the parties to understand the, the position. This is why the baseline is so, so important. Um, so uh, also, not only the baseline is important, but also the, the program updates are important. Uh, why so? Because uh, they establish and, and identify the actual critical path. You should, be, uh, you should note that the actual critical path takes 80% of uh, our day job. We're trying to identify the actual critical path because contemporaneously this was not defined properly. Therefore, is a major, major point of dispute between the parties. Then uh, the program updates establish a good control and monitoring of the project itself. How, being a construction engineer myself in the past, I know how important it is to know whether your project is on time or in delay and by how much, as discussed. It instills trust between the stakeholders. So when you are, uh, if you're the contractor area putting in a claim, it's easier to get your claim across if the owner trusts that you're telling the truth and not the other way around. It identifies problems early and can allow quick resolution. So uh, the parties would have a different approach to the job if they would think that they were in one month of delay, as explained in the previous example, and a different approach whether if they thought that they were in seven months of delay. And uh, program updates also set the standards for proper record keeping. This means that if you have um, a really good program and you are updating this correctly and in a timely manner, it actually kind of forces your team to behave accordingly. If you have a program of 5,000 activities, your planner will be asking for, in, for, for input from all stakeholders within, uh, uh, within the actual project, just to be sure that the program updates are correct. And last but not least, uh, the program updates, uh, along with the baseline, can be used for EOT requests, early warnings, and notifications. Um, since, if, in order to go back to, to the title of this presentation, how do we avoid delays? 
to be simply put, we avoid delays by telling the truth contemporaneously. I know this is not the case because we've seen so, so many projects uh, get into uh, delay. And we always know that uh, there, there are differences of opinion between the different parties. However, if you follow these simple rules of uh, program uh, drafting and program updating, it, it will be easier for you to get consensus contemporaneously and actually get your EOTs, get your claims uh, uh, across and resolve all uh, delays contemporaneously. And that is, um, uh, that, is, that is the proper way to do this. And thank you. That would be all. And um, now we will, Simon, we'll move to Ewan. Luke, thank you very much. Um, a, a very good summary of, of some of the key issues in my experience that, that uh, caused significant delays in, in large construction projects, uh, particularly the failure to deal with um, impact on the baseline. Ewan, uh, from your perspective, uh, can you give us some um, expert analysis on the, on the different methodologies that you use to assess um, these issues? Yes, thank you, Simon and uh, and Luke um, and Colin, um, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of record keeping in delay disputes in arbitration, whilst also discussing the implications of COVID-19 in delay and disruption more generally. And I'm going to start by going through some of the characteristics of COVID-19 delays and how its effect might be analysed before setting out the methodologies and the records that are needed for such an analysis. But uh, firstly, good record keeping can significantly assist in the success of a party's case in arbitration and can potentially even avoid disputes altogether. And without good records in an arbitration, even the best delay experts in the world can be neutralized because a good delay expert report is not just founded on robust and detailed analysis, but also on the quality of records or evidence supporting that analysis. Um, now, COVID-19 has introduced new causes of loss of productivity that will not have been so prevalent in historic loss of productivity analyses. Indeed, the variable effects of the pandemic could result in some surprising rerouting of the uh, critical path which I will hopefully show in the next two slides. So in this uh, first slide, uh, we can see a simple project commencing at the beginning of March with a critical path proceeding through the design and then construction before testing and commissioning leading to completion. In the second slide, I've updated the program for progress at the beginning of April. And we can see that um, the, the design has been able to progress. That's illustrated by the blue bar because designers have been able to work from home whilst procurement has stalled with no progress. And this results in the critical path switching out of design and into procurement. So therefore it's important to recognize that different disciplines of the project may be affected in different ways. And these differences will need to be accounted for in any loss of productivity analysis in order to assess uh, the impact of COVID-19. And COVID-19 is also likely to have affected construction projects in different ways at uh, different times. And I've shown this on my next slide. Which shows effectively that productivity achieved on site may have dropped even prior to any lockdown measures being imposed by national governments, as uh, there may have been shortages of labour through absenteeism from sickness or self-isolation or travel restrictions. Indeed, on international contracts, the influence of COVID-19 may have been even greater as different countries are in different phases of the pandemic. Then there's a, there's a second phase, which is as lockdown measures are imposed by national governments, and this is likely to have had an even greater adverse effect on productivity as contractors are forced to work under more restricted site operating procedures. For example, these may sort of include the, the minimisation 
uh, sorry, minimizing the number of workers involved with a particular task or using one-way systems to move around site. And then thirdly, uh, even as lockdown measures are relaxed, productivity may not return to pre-lockdown or undisrupted levels, as there may still be, for example, phased or staggered returns to working or still some site operating uh, procedures causing restrictions. So COVID-19 is very likely to have caused delay to construction projects and parties will be keen to adopt strategies that will be able to recover lost time, such as working longer hours. Uh, however, as, as you will, we'll, we'll just have a look at this, uh, my next slide, it, it, can be, it should be recognized that uh, working longer hours can in itself lead to a loss of productivity. Don't think by doubling the number of hours people work to carry out the same task will equate to uh, that task being carried out at half the time. Because we can see in this, in this slide here, which is based on some empirical studies, um, uh, uh, of productivities achieved on site under particular conditions, then increasing the hours from 40 hours on the, um, and on the horizontal axis to 60 hours, if you follow the red line up, the average loss of productivity that was found was a 20% drop. And of course, if you think about it, working longer hours on site, uh, people are gonna get fatigued and there is more, very likely to be a drop in productivity. So how can we expect such uh, losses of productivity to be evidenced in arbitration? Well, there are actually uh, many methods and they broadly fall into two categories. Firstly, um, uh, productivity-based uh, methods and secondly, cost-based methods. Uh, and these are shown here on, on this slide, which is actually based upon the UK's S, uh, Society Construction Laws Delay and Disruption Protocol. Um, the most commonly accepted method is the measured mile approach, which compares the level of productivity achieved during a period of disruption with that uh, that was achieved during a period when the works were not disrupted. And reasons why this method of assessment is often preferred include um, assessing productivity that is specific to a particular site and because it compares the actual product productivity that could be achieved with the productivity that could still be achieved but for the disruption. And because of that, it doesn't rely on tender allowances, which might be unrealistic, or data from other sites or studies that are less relevant to the particular project in question. In addition, uh, such analyses are also more likely to be supported by site diaries and from personnel on site, which may be helpful if, if these witnesses are providing factual witness statements in arbitration. Now, uh, in my next slide, I, I'm going to walk you through uh, an example before then coming to the records that are needed. And we can see on this slide, uh, I've got here the performance of a tunnel boring machine planning to carry out a 400 meter long drive between the 2nd of March and the 4th of April. And we can see that the planned productivity which is illustrated by the green line um, was 11.8 meters a day. However, the actual productivity achieved during a period of undisrupted progress is illustrated by, on, in, by the blue line in window two, uh, which is the, the second block along on the chart where af after a, a learning curve uh, where, where the parties uh, sorry, where the, where the gangs were getting to know the work, uh, there was an undisrupted period of, of progress of 11.1 .1 metres a day. And that is important because that is the benchmark by which any loss of productivity should be measured, as it demonstrates the project productivity that can actually be achieved without disruption and doesn't rely on the possibly unrealistic tender allowances. Then if we follow the blue line along, we follow it into window three, which is a pre-lockdown phase, and we can see that the productivity drops to 5.4 meters per day, perhaps due to crew members self-isolating. And then we follow uh, the, the actual productivity to window four, and we can see that 
uh, during lockdown itself, the productivity dropped to just two meters a day because of probably all sorts of issues with supply chain issues, instructions, changing access points, et cetera. And then finally, in the last window, the productivity picks up uh, as lockdown measures are relaxed. Um, and uh, whilst additional hours were worked, um, there was they, the, the contractor would still have to comply with site operating procedures. So whereas the productivity increased in the period, it does not increase commensurate with the number of increased hours worked on site. As this in itself, as I, as I was talking earlier, introduced less productive working. Um, the loss of productivity can then be assessed each day or for each period uh, and valued by assessing the cost for the additional people, equipment and materials. So in this example, the, the, uh, in the period of lockdown, the actual productivity was two metres a day in window four, which can be compared with the undisrupted productivity of 11.1 .1 metres per day. So the loss of productivity is 11.1 .1 minus two or 9.1 .1 metres a day. And this can be used to explain any extended duration in carrying out these works and valued by costing the resources used. Cost-based methods, if you ever come across those in arbitration by themselves, analyze differences between planned and actual expenditure without having first analyzed any loss of productivity in terms of resources. Accordingly, they're generally a less robust approach than project-specific studies, but can still be a useful cross-check. So it's evident that uh, you're going to need sufficiently detailed records, which are, are, are key to a good uh, analysis of loss of productivity leading to delay. So what are the records that need to be kept? And hopefully my final slide will appear here. Um, and uh, I've, I've put up a selection of records here, but uh, firstly, records relevant to progress and analysing loss of productivity should be generated contemporaneously or at the time. And these will include, as we see here, programmes, progress records, resource records and cost records. Um, programmes should record the actual progress of all activities within the scope of works so at regular intervals. and potentially not just at the sort of regular monthly intervals that are common reporting intervals in construction contracts, but also at particular events when you go into uh, lockdown or any special measures are made, you should be trying to capture the, the status of the works at that particular point. And all outstanding works uh, in the programme should be realistic and capable of achievement when you update your programme. Ideally, programmes should be resourced. Often at BlackRock, we see programmes that aren't resourced, uh, and that's why perhaps the project is in dispute. <laughs> and it should identify principal equipment and other resources. Progress records. Progress records should be kept daily. Um, there might be uh, arguments to be so, so, uh, arguments made to, that they should be even more regular than that on, on particular. Uh, specific activities, but they should also uh, address uh, uh, at what times uh, and, and where people and equipment was uh, being utilised. Typical records might include various reports called recording manpower, deliveries, site conditions, working hours, major plant and equipment used, uh, and these reports, or perhaps daily site diaries, should also include uh, specific details of issues that might be the cause of a loss of productivity, such as a, a specific site operating procedure that has been imposed. But uh, some of the most persuasive records I've found in my experience are webcam footage and progress photographs, which should be clearly annotated, um, as these represent the true status of the progress firsthand. And this is opposed to, say, a program that uh, has had a planner interpret the data to insert the progress data into the program. And sometimes at BlackRock, we find that that's not always been done accurately. So primary records that are unequivocal showing the status of the progress uh, are, are particularly valuable. 
Um, you may find uh, these records in detailed weekly, monthly progress reports for identifying causes of delay, but you're probably going to need some further detailed analysis uh, to establish the effects of any loss of productivity, because we can see from the example I gave, it's very data hung hungry. You're going to need metrics. Uh, you're going to have to record all causes of delay. Um, Design is often very important as well. Um, as we've seen on this uh, in, my, in my presentation, uh, the design can continue to proceed with people working from home, uh, whereas um, uh, procurement might stall, the supply chains dry up. But um, if you're still um, trying to track the design, you're going to need details of all the drawings, not just the most current drawing, but all the drawing revisions so you can tell, tell the full story. So I think my, my, my time is up. So I, resource records and cost records um, detail the similar information that uh, is uh, recorded on this slide. And uh, I do have details of, of these slides if, if, if you wanted any further information. But I'd also just point you finally to um, the detailed list of typical records contained in Appendix B of the of the UK's SEL delay and disruption uh, cost, um, protocol, because that actually sets out all these programs, progress records, uh, and further records, including correspondent, and, and is a very useful uh, aid memoir or list that uh, parties could use. So that concludes uh, my my, my uh, piece, Simon. Thank you very much, Ewan. That, that was very informative. Um, uh, and there, we've got a couple of questions on the productivity issues uh, during question time. Um, if I can now ask Marily uh, to address parties um, where they do need to resort to arbitration, what sort of issues should they be considering uh, to ensure that the arbitration runs as efficiently uh, as possible? Marily. Thank you, Simon. And uh, welcome uh, to all also uh, on this uh, this joint Phil Fisher BlackRock uh, webinar today. Uh, indeed, I will now look at how and whether it's possible and how to avoid delays once a construction dispute has been submitted to um, arbitration. And although this may appear uh, difficult or impossible to some, uh, I will try to show you that uh, it is not. Um, now I will try to move my slide uh, here. I think that should work. Um, so before I, I start discussing the various techniques, tools, or considerations that parties should have in mind, I would like to have a look at this chart that comes from the 2019 International Arbitration Survey published uh, the, uh, towards the end of last year, which shows that the most frequently used procedure for the resolution of construction disputes is international commercial arbitration by 71%, uh, followed by domestic commercial arbitration at a lower 39%. Uh, I think this is interesting because it shows that arbitration remains the top choice of dispute resolution mechanism, irrespective of any perceived inefficiency or cost considerations, and I refer you back to the slide, to the chart that Colin showed earlier, showing um, a few of the most uh, uh, of, the, of the criticisms against uh, international arbitration, including cost and the lack of speed. Um, so taking into account that uh, the fact that most construction disputes are likely to be submitted to arbitration for resolution, how is it possible to avoid delays during the proceedings? And how is it possible to ensure that they will be run um, quickly and that the final award will be issued and reach the parties within uh, a reasonable amount of time. Now, in trying to identify ways in which proceedings, arbitration proceedings can become efficient, we should not forget uh, that construction disputes are known for a few things that are specific uh, to them. And this includes factual and technical complexity, um, often large amounts of evidence, uh, coupled also quite often by multiple claims and or multiple parties and large amounts in dispute. So that's quite a powerful mix. And, uh, and these elements alone can cause the proceedings to last for several years in any event. 
So there's a distinction to be made between factors that contribute to proceedings taking a long time and factors that contribute to delays. Um, so uh, let's let's move on then to uh, how and at which steps of the proceedings the parties can uh, control and try to avoid uh, delay. Um, so um, last year, the ICC Commission on Arbitration and ADR issued an update on its report on construction industry arbitrations, which recommended tools and techniques for effective management of construction arbitration. Now, the report is interesting because it provides practical guidance for handling uh, these arbitrations efficiently and does take into account uh, recent developments, including the revisions of the ICC rules. It also takes into account new forms of pre-arbitral dispute resolution mechanisms, and uh, uh, Colin referred to um, dispute boards and uh, avoidance boards. It also describes case management techniques and procedural matters specific to construction arbitration, which can promote cost-efficient proceedings. And it seeks to also accommodate approaches of civil and common law systems, while recognizing that ultimately arbitrators are indeed responsible for deciding the applicable procedural rules. Now, I have chosen to focus on five aspects of the proceedings that can contribute to avoiding delays. The constitution of the tribunal, case management conference, the procedural timetable, bifurcation, and the appointment of experts. Starting with the constitution of the tribunal, uh, now it is key that the arbitrators that will decide uh, the case uh, will be well placed to do that. It is important to consider at the time of the appointment certain key characteristics when selecting the right arbitrators. Now, these and th th these elements, and I have mentioned a few on these slides, um, are recommended by the ICC report I just mentioned, but they also mentioned in the 2019 International Survey. Now, familiarity with the construction industry and its complex technical and legal issues, including main forms of construction contracts, such as BDIC, is key. Sound management, case management skills, and a certain amount of IT savviness in order to manage the increasing amount of data uh, presented to arbitrators is also very important. Um, availability to me a very uh, important uh, factor, especially in large construction disputes, um, is uh, is significant. Uh, arbitrators need to devote enough time to read, understand the volume of data and pleadings but uh, they also need to have uh, sufficient time available to deliberate and draft uh, often complex awards. Now, this is also related to the question of the number of arbitrators. Three arbitrators will necessarily take longer to review the case, deliberate and draft an award. Parties should re always remember that they do have a choice to nominate a sole arbitrator in smaller value disputes. And just to give you an idea of what that means for the ICC, um, smaller value disputes that can be submitted to a sole arbitrator can go up to 30 to a value of 30 million uh, US dollars. Now, um, that said, uh, the International Arbitration Survey of last year confirmed that parties are not very favorable of submitting their dispute to a sole arbitrator. And uh, also, the ICC Commission report confirms that uh, generally in civil law countries, um, accustomed to a judicial system of a panel of judges, um, parties may also be reluctant to submit construction disputes to a sole arbitrator. Moving on uh, to the uh, case management uh, conference. Um, this is a, a key step in the arbitration proceedings. Um, the ICC uh, report notes that the importance of the first case management conference cannot be overemphasized. Now, this takes place usually before the issuance of the first procedural order and the timetable, and it can serve as a roadmap for the arbitration. The ICC report lists a number of issues that you can see on this slide that may be usefully discussed during the case management conference. Now, most of these points apply to all arbitrations, respectively of whether they are the concerned construction disputes or not. But there are two uh, that are very specific to construction disputes, and this is the site visits and document management. Now, site visits can be very useful 
in assisting the tribunal to understand the case. Uh, but they're often, unfortunately, not contemplated at the beginning of an arbitration. And this may be problematic in case the need for a site visit uh, is only identified later, because by that time, the members of the tribunal may have less availability uh, and or the works may have progressed so as to um, alter the appearance of the work site. Um, issues in connection with document management, such as, for example, access to project documentation databases, are also frequent in construction disputes. And it may be appropriate for the parties to consider and address these issues at the very early stage of the arbitration during the case management conference. Um, moving on, the procedural timetable, obviously, when, when talking, uh, I'm sorry, I need to come back to the procedural timetable. Yes. Um, so obviously talking about delays and how to avoid delays is, uh, is, is, is key to have in mind when agreeing and establishing the timetable. Uh, now this does require a delicate balancing act between the need for running the proceedings um, quickly and the need to give enough time to each party to properly argue its case. And this is not an easy exercise. Um, it is an important one, and also uh, parties should bear in mind that timetables are generally difficult to modify after they have been established. Uh, nevertheless, it's important to consider when discussing the procedural timetable, the potential applicability of any expedited procedure rules. Um, Colin referred to the expedited provisions incorporated in a few arbitration uh, rules. Consider whether it's appropriate to make preliminary determinations on issues such as jurisdiction or admissibility. The number and order of written submissions, whether they should be uh, consecutive or um, simultaneous. Uh, the procedure and timing of document production, as well as the timing and duration of the hearing or the hearings. Uh, the recent international arbitration survey identified a few more procedural elements that are likely to increase efficiency and this is the summary disposal of unmeritorious claims or defenses at an early stage. That can be um, quite an efficient way of dealing with uh, a certain amount of claims. Uh, and the streamlining of evidential hearings and submissions. Moving on uh, to the next slide, I will discuss, I will just briefly discuss actually bifurcation. Bifurcation is another technique, if I, if I may use this term, that can efficiently contribute to an efficient resolution of the dispute. Parties can request to bifurcate the proceedings and uh, ask the tribunal to render one or more partial awards on some on certain issues. And of course, a partial award that deals with part of the claims may be enforced and produce results while the resolution of other issues is still pending. Um, and, it, and this is quite common for construction arbitrations. Uh, they are, they tend to be divided in successive stages sometimes, liability and quantum, or uh, they tend to be divided on multiple tranches or claims. Um, but not all cases are appropriate for bifurcation. So I have listed here uh, four considerations to bear in mind in order to ascertain whether bifurcation is appropriate. And that is whether the relevant issues are susceptible of being adjudicated separately whether bifurcation could result in potential cost savings, uh, whether it could expedite or delay the proceedings, and also bear in mind the prima facie likelihood of success of a party seeking bifurcation. The last uh, point I wanted to, uh, to discuss uh, is the appointment of experts. Now, in construction arbitration, more than in any other type of, of um, um, arbitration proceedings, Expert witness testimony is uh, very common, especially when it comes to uh, technical matters, uh, such as quantum delay, geotechnical matters, and others. Um, the appointment of experts has indeed become a routine feature in this field. Um, and there are a couple of points I would like to make. First, uh, it is very important to, uh, that the parties discuss at an early stage whether expertise is indeed required or whether the relevant matters, technical or other, can be proved in other ways, for example, through project documents or witness statements. Uh, 
And also for the use of experts to be efficient, it is important that the scope of the expert evidence be limited to the issues strictly relevant to the issues at stake. Now, because delays can arise by appointing several experts to provide testimony in a variety of technical fields, um, it's, uh, it's important to, to consider whether party appointed experts or tribunal appointed experts is more appropriate for any uh, for a particular for a particular case. Um, in some cases, for example, when, uh, when confronted with conflicting expert evidence, the tribunal may wish to appoint an additional expert to obtain technical assistance directly for the tribunal. Uh, now, this may be cost-effective if not accompanied by party-appointed expert, um, but, uh, and also, also because the tribunal-appointed expert may identify points upon which evidence or reports from uh, party-appointed uh, experts, experts may be needed, but the reality is that parties do tend to retain their own experts so that an, a tribunal appointed experts may not necessarily result in fewer uh, expenses. So this is again another delicate uh, balancing act that the parties should try to obtain in order to um, tailor the procedure in a manner that uh, will allow it to become efficient and uh, both time-wise and uh, cost-wise. So I will stop here and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marily. Um, we have a couple of questions for uh, the presenters. Uh, I'm going to start with Ewan. Um, Ewan, if you can, there we go. Uh, <laughs> Colin uh, and Marily discussed, um, mentioned the FIDIC contracts and the um, NECs. Do these standard forms of contract provide for specific ways to demonstrate delay and disruption? Uh, and if so, do you have, do you know the, the differences at hand? Um, the contracts don't prescribe a set method for uh, demonstrating or assessing uh, disruption. Uh, but there is an important uh, or in distinction between NEC and FIDIC in, in the way that they assess the delay. Under FIDIC, there's no set prescribed methodology that you should analyze delay by. Um, so that would generally mean when you get to an arbitration, you get a retrospective analysis, an analysis that looks back at what actually happened and where the delays were. That would contrast with NEC, um, where the contract prescribes a prospective form of delay analysis, um, delay analysis, this is, uh, looking forward which is all very well at the time, sort of proactive, good management, um, but does present enormous difficulties when you get to arbitration, um, because a prospective analysis looking forward may well turn out to be different to what actually happened. And generally, uh, my experience is tribunals will always prefer what, um, uh, what, uh, a retrospective analysis because they can see what actually happened and see what the effect and the loss or the consequence upon the breach was um, by, by reference to actual um, uh, records. So yeah, so a bit of a difference there and it's going to be very very difficult to forecast COVID-19 delays uh, because one of the things about COVID-19 is the delays relate to often relate to a loss of productivity rather than a discrete delay where a drawing was issued one month late. Um, and you're going to have to potentially forecast um, planned productivities to, to see when you can complete. Helpful, thank you. Uh, Colin, you mentioned uh, the nature of notice as being condition precedence. Uh, what types of consequences do you anticipate will follow if these notices are not served? Uh... Thank you. Yeah, I, funnily enough, I talked to our head of construction the other day in advance of this to say, what is construction? Can you help me with this? <laughs> and the very first thing he said is notices, notices, notices. So thank you to Dan Preston. Uh, two things for me, one delay and one more cataclysmic. Failure to give a notice at all can be the end. That's a disaster. So I did one case a few years ago where a client, uh, a contractor, obviously had a good 12 million claim, but actually, because he didn't give the not right notices, the right time, that claim was sliced down to seven. That's bad news. So that, that's cataclysm rather than delay. 
But the other is the other is um, giving bad notices. So if you have to give a notice in a prescribed form, uh, in a particular way with a level of detail, it is worth putting in the extra time to get that right, rather than spending additional time at every stage in the process arguing about whether whether you can do it or not. And it can make a difference to what outcome you get before, for example, a DAB. So um, yeah, I'm obsessed with notice assignment. It makes a lot of sense given the number of disputes that arise from bad, badly drafted or, or failure to present notices. Uh, indeed, uh, Luke, you, you, you highlighted the importance of the baseline. Why, in your opinion, aren't these programs regularly updated? Um, okay. Um, to begin, I would say that uh, normally in uh, complex construction projects, you might have a program of thousands of activities. We've seen programs of 17,000 activities, for example. And the process of updating such a program is so, so long and that you may have a case where you issue the program update and then on the very next day you start updating your next program and that's that task is really complicated and of course when you have to update 17,000 activities lots of things can go wrong that uh, so the level of detail in the programs is actually key when you want to update a program properly um, sometimes so it's lack of time other times there are um, some strategies of the contractors we would also highlight that meaning if you want to hide delays or if you want to paint a different picture for your project, you can manipulate your program to actually do so. You can, as, as I explained in my, in my uh, example, you can show smaller delays, bigger delays, you can show no delay at all, etc. So this also uh, actually creates confusion around the program updates. Um, and finally, I would say that sometimes whether if you are just missed the critical path from day one and you can just have wrong focus of the job itself. So when you're trying to, to update your program properly, you might you might update in this towards actually an, an area that might not be critical at the time. And final point, um, we've seen many, many projects where different parties are are um, are recording different progress when they refer to the same activities. So the site might say that um, a said construction activity might be at 20%, then the project management team might might report 35% in the, in the monthly progress report, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need to do is we need to cross-check all the different numbers. So consistency throughout all records is also, also very important. Great, thanks, Luke. Uh, we've got one question which I'm gonna put out to everybody. I know we're running late, but we still have a number of, we still have a lot of attendees online so provided the facility can allow it. I think we'll just keep asking questions until uh, all the attendees have got bored and uh, and logged off. Um, a question to everybody. Um, although Colin, uh, you dealt with FMs and and you and you dealt with the impact of COVID, uh, so you may want to both think about this. Um, the questioner asks that he appreciates uh, this will be dependent on the specific form of contract, but do you believe COVID will present more cases of FM? Uh, frustration of the contract. Come what do you want to do, you and who? Who's going to go first? Well, so did I, I, mean, say, I, did I hear FM and frustration. Yeah, FM and frustration. Well, I think Colin, you should take frustration, as that's um, firmly in the in the legal world. I'll just comment on um, force majeure. Firstly. Um, one, recognise your former contract because under the NEC former contract, uh, you don't have force majeure, you have prevention. Um, and prevention is a clause that will entitle you to time and money. Force majeure, um, which I suspect uh, Colin will be able to comment upon more, um, is, well, it's a, it's a, it's a creature of the, of the contract. You have to consult the contract to see the precise wording of it but you may only be entitled to uh, time and not uh, money. So you'd get relief from liquidated damages, but you wouldn't necessarily get additional costs. So therefore, there are people or parties scanning their contracts for potentially other clauses that they can uh, get entitlement for time and money. And that may be through, uh, they may have received some instructions, depending on the country they're working in, there may have been legislation pass for a particular lockdown, uh, which might uh, also give rise to an entitlement. And then there are also other clauses that uh, potentially contractors can hang their hat on from uh, from acts, 
sort of uh, lack of access uh, type type clauses as well. So so my thoughts are basically yes, watch out for the NEC. That's slightly different. Force um, is prevention, not force majeure. Uh, be aware that uh, force majeure can often just get time but not money and therefore there are other clauses that may be available uh, if you want the money as well. Over to you Colin. Well that, that, that's hard to follow, there was a lot of wisdom in there, thank you for that. Um, I mean, I, From a force measure perspective, uh, we are seeing lots of inquiries about force measure, not just in construction, not just in um international contracts but across the board um and and i agree with what you and said on that frustration obviously will vary from country to country by applicable law um and i have to say from an english law perspective talking about frustration is almost like talking about waiver and estoppel when you're having a contract argument it's a place you don't want to be um i would much rather see good contract terms um and uh, and playing it out under the wording of the contract rather than uh, relying on some ancient cases about the rerouting of a coronation procession and all of those things that Simon will remember from uh, when he was a boy. Uh, <laughs> so um, it's difficult though. I, I do think that there will certainly be a leap in people trying it, um, but I, I, I agree with you and maybe time without money. Uh, so there will be other clauses that will be more helpful. Um, thank you very much, both of you. Marilee, uh, you mentioned a number of um, management techniques uh, that help the efficient running. Are these the key issues or are there other methodologies or approaches that might be more efficient or assist? Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 these are some main, main considerations, techniques or uh, case management uh, methods. Uh, but I think that the, the even more important to, to this, because these are just tools, in my view, that can be implemented by parties and their council. Uh, I think the most important thing is for the parties themselves to have the right attitude during the uh, arbitration uh, itself. For example, what I mean is that the parties should actually focus on resolving the dispute rather than try to, for example, leave no stone unturned and find you know, address every every possible issue in an arbitration that can, you know, burden the proceeding and not lead to, you know, a timely resolution of the dispute. Um, parties should also keep uh, an open mind uh, to settlements and and be, um, you know, when they see an opportunity for settlement of one or several of their claims, they should approach it with the right attitude and leave behind the appetite for uh, for fight. Uh, but also during the proceedings, uh, parties should actively participate, uh, cooperate. For example, in um, uh, in cases where uh, finding the right uh, evidence, project records, etc., is 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 very important, or effectively use uh, technology to better maintain and provide documents and records. So these are also considerations that the parties can handle, uh, you know, ha have at their at their disposal but they should not be uh, underestimated because uh, the right attitude can also lead to the right uh, and timely resolution, I think. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I concur with all of those. Uh, you and you, you're a popular man at the moment on productivity. I think uh, it's raised a number of queries from people. I'll try and just focus on one more. Um, I've got one myself, but I won't ask that. Uh, we'll leave that for when we get offline. Um, if the actual productivity during lockdown is well below what is believed to be possible, how would you determine the real effect or the extension of time required? Essentially, I think how do you carve out any COVID impact uh, to remove the, any reduction in pro COVID productivity? Well, one of the key points in that question that I heard, it, it, it's it's where it, the productivity was believed to be. It was well below what it believed to be. The strength of the measured mile uh, approach is that it's comparing with you've measured productivity in times when COVID-19 wasn't around. Now, um, that may not be actually available to parties now because site operating procedures restrict working now what is the productivity that 
could be achieved. Uh, you, my, my first comment would be you need to make it as real as possible. So if you do have some sort of similar data that you can compare current productivity levels with, that's great. If you don't, and you might have to recognize that you don't, you, um, you, you could perhaps try and seek that your uh, planned productivity was reasonable based on norms or um, or other historic data. Um, alternatively, you might just seek to rely on the program. Uh, that wouldn't be my favorite approach, but um, if, you've, if you're capturing um, the status of the works pre-lockdown, during lockdown, you, you should be able to start to get some uh, idea of how much time has been slipping in each month and if you, or, or each week. And if you can um, correlate that back to the methods of working and that there weren't any other uh, external influences slowing the productivity down, it might be reasonable to say, well, yes, OK, that must be causing our, our current rate of progress because there aren't any other influencing factors and we've isolated it. Um, other than that, I did provide a slide with the methods available um, uh, of assessing productivity. and I. They started it with the measured mile at, at the top, which I think is probably the best method. Uh, the methods then dilute, but you can use data from uh, perhaps other sites, but you would also be criticized because that's not site project specific. But it's just a matter of maximizing, maximizing the data you've got available to prove your case. Um, um, and hopefully, I mean, uh, I would say yes. I'd like to run it past me just to see whether I think it might be uh, 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 suitable for arbitration, but um, uh, it, it may it may or may not be. But um, yeah. So it goes back essentially to making sure, in all cases, you properly document uh, the, the the information and the data and and manage that the contract properly. Um, Absolutely. Goes back to Max Abrahams and you know the importance of records, the importance of records, and the importance of records. Yeah, but off you know if you've got great records, parties don't always end up in a dispute, and um, the ones that find their way to arbitration sometimes have limitations with records. Yeah, fair enough. I, I we've gone over 13 minutes, so I think the presenters deserve a break. Thank you all for attending. Um, uh, very interesting. I think it could have continued for another hour. Uh, so maybe. The, the scheduling was correct that we should have run questions for an hour as well, maybe next time. Thank you all for attending uh, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Paris Arbitration uh, Week session that Marilee is running together with uh, my colleague Maxon from our Brussels office and a number of members from the Institute. Marilee, if you want to give a final plug uh, and then we'll shut down. Yes, thank you, Simon. I uh, just uh, uh, wish to thank you all for, for attending this first uh, Phil Fisher Paris Arbitration Week event. Indeed, we're running a second event on Thursday uh, with uh, representatives of six major arbitral institutions, and uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.